Well, uh, so excited about tonight and uh, so looking forward to all that God's going to do. I want to welcome those who may be watching online. And um, if you're wondering when the music was going to stop, it stopped. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I, I just want to say, um, say this on, on, on the outset that uh, faith comes by hearing, yeah. hearing by the word of God. So what's going to happen tonight is your faith is going to increase. And we know that it's our faith that moves mountains. Yeah. It's our faith. That by faith, we receive everything from God. And so amazing things are going to, are going to happen. Um, it, it's not uncommon for people to be healed before we even get to prayer, right. just while we teach. So um, that might happen to you tonight, just while we're teaching. Something will be said. it will spark something in your heart. And, and you'll, just, you'll just receive. You'll be healed. Uh, it'll happen to you. Um, people that are watching online, we've had people watching online, and God touched them and healed them just while they're hearing the word of God. So um, it's the power of God's word, and it's faith in God's word, and, and healing happens. And as we keep that, um, you know, in mind, we keep that in our hearts, um, good things are going to happen tonight. Well, um, I'm going to share with you a story to, to start this off, and, and then I'm going to um, get into uh, my theme, which is this, removing the obstacles to receiving a miracle uh, be, so that we are, are free to receive. But here's a story that's fairly recent from our church. As a matter of fact, this lady, I don't know if she's in the room tonight, Sarah, but th this lady came to me only a couple of months ago all excited because, you know, she was able to bring her baby to church and to show me the, this miracle baby. And, um, but I, I want to tell you, here's, here's the story. In 2008, uh, Sarah and her husband had adopted her daughter. And in 2010, she started to get sick all the time, but wasn't sure why, and was unable to get pregnant. So they had an adopted child, but they were also wanting to get pregnant. Uh, late 2011, she was told that it was not likely that she would be able to get pregnant and was suggested that she should actually have her uterus removed. In 2015, her friend introduced her to uh, Air and Rich Chu. Some people know them. In her, specifically to their connect group, and she began to attend their connect group. Um, and then she goes on to say that we got introduced to Christianity in 2015 through a friend of hers, uh, Eloisa, and have finally accepted Christ on Good Friday of 2016 over the phone talking to her friend. How many of you know you, you can receive Jesus over the phone talking to a friend? Come on. It's not just something that happens in church, but you have people you're reaching out to, and you can have that kind of phone call. Um, and, then, and then she says this. She says, I believe there is, God, is a God, and I also heard of many miracle stories. However, I've been super skeptical about these miracles and wondered, can God actually hear us? But miracles are real. It happened to me. I had been really ill since 2012 on a, very regu on a regular basis, and after many exams, I was told that a big part of my uterus was actually missing. Therefore, it was causing a lot of pain. Since the pain was so severe, I ended up on um, you know, high level of painkillers and would need surgery, they said, every couple of years. The specialist doctor told me that the only way to cure my disease would be that if she got pregnant, for the uterus would naturally grow back to protect the baby. This seemed to be a joke to me because a big part of my uterus was not there, so how could I even possibly get pregnant? Of course, <clears throat> this was our last hope, so we had tried many different things, different programs and medications and getting blood work done every month, but nothing worked for years. Sadly, I gave up. All I wanted was to no longer be in pain. I didn't even want to get pregnant anymore. One day I was chatting with Air, and she suggested that I get prayer after a Sunday service, have a group of people pray for her. So I agreed to it. The day comes, and during the service, 
I heard the name Isaac. Now, think about this. Joel was talking about hearing God, right? In, in the service, in worship, these things. During the service, I heard the name Isaac in my heart, and it felt so warm. While the group was praying over me, I can feel that warmth growing inside my body. It was an amazing feeling that I will never forget. After we got home from church, I told my husband that I think I'm pregnant because I heard the name Isaac. He just smiled and didn't take it very seriously at that time. <laughs> A little bit of husband bashing right going on there. But. Four weeks later, I did a pregnancy test, yeah. and it was positive. Yeah. My doctor was really surprised and sent me to do a couple of blood tests and three different ultrasound exams. Three months later, the doctor's office also confirmed that it was a boy, yeah. just as I expected that God would give me a son. Through the ultrasound, we found out, get this, that the conception date is the exact Sunday I got prayed for. And her baby boy, Isaac, is now six months old. And so she wanted to, wanted to share, share that story. Isn't that so phenomenal? Yeah. I, just love, I just love hearing stories of God doing those things. And if you've been around our church uh, for a while, you know that's not like a one-off. Yeah. We have several of those kinds of stories. But I want to talk to you about some of the hindrances so that we can, we can reverse that in our life and change that in our life and help ourselves be able to go forward and help ourselves be able to, to uh, receive from God. And the first one is very straightforward, unbelief, unbelief. Mark chapter 6, 1 through 6. I hope you're ready for quite a bit of Bible here tonight. This, this won't be like, you know, two verses and then I'll talk for 30 minutes. It's, it's going to be a lot of Bible going on here. Uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 1 says this, Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many listeners were astonished saying, where did this man get these things and what is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as these performed by his hands. So they're, they're observing the miracles here. You know, they're hearing the word, but they're also seeing the signs and wonders happening. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and, Joseph and, and Judas and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? Notice how different the direction is going here. And, and they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could not, and he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them and he wondered at their unbelief. Well, no wonder Jesus wondered because these people were seeing people getting healed and then chose to go in a direction that was basically disrespectful, that was basically saying, oh, you're just this kid we grew up with. You're a carpenter's son. You went to the same school. We know your brothers. We know your family kind of thing. And now we're all upset about all this attention going on. But here's the thing to pick up, and that is this. Because of unbelief, Jesus didn't say he would not do many miracles. It says he could not. In other words, he wanted to, but he was restricted by the condition of their heart. Could not do many miracles because of their unbelief. Their unwillingness to believe in who Jesus was. And, and, and he was prevented then from being able to be received by them. He could not do many miracles. You know, um, last year, I, uh, I had surgery done on my eyes, which is why people went, why don't you wear glasses? Well, because I fixed it. Um, and when I went to the doctor, he explained that we're going to take your lenses out and put in new lenses in, in your eyes, which is why none of my family were in faith about this. And they all told me I was crazy to go and do this because it's such a crazy story of just how it all happened. Anyway, any rate, that's another side point. Um, but uh, just like Jesus, you know what happens at home. At any rate... <laughs> But, but here's the point. Here's the point. 
I didn't look at the doctor and say, I don't believe you. He just explained to me what he was going to do. He just gave me his word. And what did I do? I took him at his word. I'm like, okay, that sounds great. <laughs> then he told me it was going to cost. But at any rate, um, <laughs> but here's the deal. The scripture talks about us receiving the word as the word of God, not of men. In other words, if I'm willing to believe what a doctor told me he could do, how much more should I believe what God has told me what he can do and put faith in that? We're to receive the word as a word of God, not as a word of men. Unbelief can simply be, though, rooted in a lack of knowledge of God's promises or religious excuses as why God can't heal today. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many people are here in, from that background. That maybe you grew up in a background where it was literally taught about why the supernatural doesn't happen today, why healing doesn't happen, why people don't speak in tongues and all the rest. I've met too many people that speak in tongues, and I've seen too many people healed to believe that. And not only that, I have a Bible that tells me otherwise. But the deal is this. You need to fill your heart with the promises of God and renew your thinking. That's what needs to happen. Don't let religious, unbelieving, uh, an unbelieving past keep you from God's promises for today. And I'm going to talk about other things that can try to rob you. But I, I said this to the prayer partners, which you're going to get to meet later uh, in the service, that uh, said, how do I build faith? Well, I took my Bible and I went through all the Gospels. And in every place where there's a story or a verse dealing with healing, I put a letter H beside it. And the reason is, is because then I can go back through it and I can refresh my heart with the word. How many of you know something? It's not the scripture you've got memorized, it's the scripture you've meditated. It's what goes into our heart that builds faith and it's faith that, uh, that moves mountains. That, that's how this thing works. And so it was enough when I think of Sarah's story she just responded with faith. Why don't we pray for you? Okay, let's do that. Let's go, go for it. That was enough to respond with faith and then receive. I also love the part about the story that Sarah didn't devalue the prayers of her friends. I want you to hear this. She didn't look and go, oh, you're just so-and-so. You're at my connect group. I know who you are, and I know all your weaknesses you know, and, and I know where you're good. And where you're, she didn't have that, or she didn't have this attitude like, I need the pastor to pray for me. Right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and I, I so appreciate that because, you know, the truth of the matter is, is the promises of God are on the saints. You will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Yeah. That's what the promises are on. And honestly, if we're taking a posture that says, well, I just need the pastor to pray for me, I think two things about that. One is it's dishonor towards the Jesus that's in your friends. Okay? Like they got a little Jesus, I got a big Jesus. Forget it. That's not how this thing works. Secondly, it can also be pride. It's like, and, and the truth of the matter is, is, there are so many people in this congregation full of faith, ready to lay hands on people and see them heal. We have healing testimonies uh, that have happened. I already got two of them just off of the prayer meetings this week of people that got healed because somebody in their group said, oh, you're sick here, let me pray for you. And God touched their body. So anyway, we don't want to go there. But the people in the story of Jesus uh, in their hometown, they got into familiarity and dishonor and all, all the rest of it. And, and so... The point is this, and why I want to bring this up tonight, and that is this, is that we are looking to Jesus to be our healer founded on his word. So it's not about who prayed for me. It's, it's, it's got nothing to do with it. They're a vessel. They're a vehicle. But ultimately, I'm looking to God. My faith is in God, and I'm taking him for his word Rather than going to a space in my head where it's like, well, I just got prayed for by Fred. No wonder I'm still struggling. You know what I'm saying? We don't want to go like, we don't want to go there. Okay. Okay. Second thing. Second thing that can be a hindrance is this. Legalism. Legalism. John 9, 1 through 3. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he would be born blind. 
Jesus answered, it was neither. It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, this is how legalism plays out when it comes to faith for a miracle. Typically, it's when people might be, you know, are, are praying and maybe they haven't yet received or hasn't. And then their, their head can go to a place of legalism instead of grace where they now start to go, oh, well, maybe there's something wrong with the formula here. Maybe there's something I haven't quite got right here. Maybe there's something that's, you know, that about my walk or something like that. And they can go to a place where, you know, they get out of favor in terms of what they're believing God for. Legalism takes us to a place of evaluation, where just like these guys were, was it your sin? Was it your parents? Like, why is this going on? And, and we can be like that about receiving healing in our lives where it's like, well, did I do right? Did I pray right? Um, did I pray from my heart or just from my head? Um, do I have some sin in my life? Um, ha maybe I have something I haven't surrendered to the Lord. Maybe I haven't confessed enough scriptures or read the Bible enough this week. When we start asking those questions, we're in a place of legalism. That's really what it is. Galatians 3, 5 says this. So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit, listen, and work miracles among you, okay, this is speaking to the church, do it by works of the law or hearing with faith. In other words, is this about your performance that you're good enough to get from God? And sadly, sadly, people have had sickness issues in their family and had well-meaning but unbiblical Christians come and talk to them about, was it your sin or was it, and come and bring their legalistic, judgmental spirit when God says, it's by hearing by faith, not works of the law. And terrible, hurtful things have been said to people about why somebody God he didn't get healed, all our sickness, all that stuff, and turned it into religious legalism. Now, God moving on your behalf, all of a sudden, in legalism, becomes about your performance and being good enough to receive. Jesus healed people, listen, who were not yet Christ followers. Yeah. Jesus healed sinners who didn't deserve to be healed, didn't deserve miracles. How do you know that? Because he ministered to crowds and he didn't have an altar call first. Yeah. <laughs> People heard he was healing and then it says these crowds just followed him and it's like, okay, here we go again. You know, and he starts healing all these people. They, they weren't Christians. They, they didn't just come from church to get healed. Yeah. They, were just, they were just the audience, just the people around him. And Jesus is healing these people. You gotta know, they were not there yet in terms of, you know, some kind of walk with God and I'm, I'm this perfect Christian, whatever that is. Not at all. And Jesus healed them. So they believed and they received. When we reach out to God in the context of our performance, we start to get into this evaluation. Have I sinned? Did I read my Bible every day? Did I pray the right words? You know, I, I need to pray it. You know, I need to mix the right two healing scriptures together. You know, this is kind of where we go. We kind of almost treat healing like magic. You know, if I can just take the right two healing scriptures and I mix them together and I say them in a King James manner, <laughs> I, I'll cast a healing spell on you. There you go. That prayer ought to work. Mm. It's faith. It's not magic. It's faith. You know, did I pray right? Did I quote the right scriptures? Have I been overcoming every temptation this week? You know, this can just be religious legalism, and it doesn't position you to receive a miracle. Yeah. Miracles are received by faith, yeah. the same way you receive salvation. You know, when you got saved, you just said, yes, Jesus, yeah. and you allowed him into your heart. You know, you didn't say, just a minute, I got some things to clean up to make myself good enough that's not how this thing happens. You just said, yes, Jesus. Jesus acknowledged faith in people all the time when it came to receiving miracles. See, the promises in the Bible 
like I say, they're, 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 they're there to build faith in our heart. And, and God is not moved because we demand results because we're quoting the right scriptures and telling him, therefore, you have to. In other words, here's what I'm trying to say. You can pray and, and you can quote scripture and actually have almost like an intention of twisting God's arm. Like that would almost be the image. It's like, okay, God, you said this and you said this and you said, therefore, you have, you know what I'm saying? But that's not the spirit in which we're to pray. The spirit in which we're to quote scripture, and we should quote scripture. Scripture is powerful. But the spirit in which we quote it is from our heart in faith. Like, God, you said this and you said this. So we thank you right now in Jesus' name that we can receive. And it's from a spirit of faith that is being prayed. Not from an attitude of, uh, of you know, legalism or manipulation or whatever you would try to call that. James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders or spiritually mature people of the church, and they are to pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, and this is what I want you to catch. This is so important. If he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. So here the scripture is telling us, listen, if you're sick, get somebody to pray for you so that you can get healed. Oh, by the way, if you've committed sins, if you have some faults in your life, if you have some struggles that you're going through, I just want you to know as well, God's going to not only heal you, but he already forgives you, which means he's not holding it against you as reason why you can't receive. You see, under the old covenant, the scriptures read, if you obey the Lord, he won't put any diseases on you. Under the new covenant, it's if you sin, God will forgive you. He won't hold it against you, and he'll heal you because it's all done by faith and grace anyway. No wonder the new covenant is called a better covenant than the old covenant. Come on. You see, it's about being confident in your righteousness and your justification, which I think is so important for receiving from God, is having a confidence that, you know what, I'm a child of God because of Jesus. I am not a child of God because oh, I didn't argue with my wife this week, and, you know, I didn't get mad when I got cut off in, in the church parking lot, and I, you know, I, you know what I'm saying? We're, we can get to that, and it's like that is so derailed from faith and grace. And so, and so it's about be, just being confident. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm in a position to receive. I, I'm a child of God. I'm accepted by If I died, I'd go to heaven right now. Um, you know, that's where I'm at. Legalism will always focus the attention on your lack, your failure, your insufficiency. And if you're questioning your righteousness before God, it's a hindrance to faith. But know this, even in that scripture where it talks about healing, he says, I'm going to heal you. And by the way, if you've got anything that you've messed up on, I'm going to forgive you. I'm not going to hold it against you. Talk about confidence in righteousness and right standing before God. That you know what? You're not a child of God because you did a perfect day today. And are going to try and do a perfect day tomorrow either. You're a child of God because of the blood of Jesus. Full stop. Faith focuses its attention on God's abundance, his generosity, his ability, his promises, and his sufficiency. Legalism focuses on the mistakes that we've made. Faith focuses on the goodness of God. Legalism focuses on the sin of man. Faith focuses on the salvation of Jesus. Legalism points to you. Faith always points to him. Legalism is about what you deserve. Faith is about his favor on your life, giving you what you need, not what you deserve. Legalism fuels unbelief because you can always find a reason for God not to bless you. Faith, however, fuels grace because it embraces God's unconditional love and his promises. Make a decision. Jesus is healing you tonight, and it's not about you. It's not about you. Second Corinthians 1.20 says, For as many as are the promises of God, 
In Jesus, in him, they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God. They are yes, not if. In the old covenant, they were if. In the New Testament, they're yes. Come on. We, we've got to secure that and understand that we're, we're, not, we're not walking with an if God. We're walking with a yes God. Jesus changed the if that judges and condemns into a yes that saves and gives us grace. I want to say one more thing because this is so important. James tells believers that if you're sick, you need to tell some people and get them, get them to pray for you. And I want to tell you, uh, frankly, I've watched believers, and I'm going to call it what it is, be proud. I don't want anybody to know. I don't want other people coming to pray. You know, just the pastor can come and pray for me. I, let's just call it what it is. And I've seen them pass away. And I look and I think, I got to be honest, you're not walking in the word. You say you got faith for God to heal you, but the word of God says be humble, let people know, embrace people's involvement into your world to pray for you. So I, I'm just saying that, put that in your ear. Don't, don't ever feel like, you know, well, you know, I'm dealing with this thing, but I don't want to burden anybody. It's not a burden. It's just being obedient to God and, and just doing what he's told us to do. Okay, number three, here's another hindrance. And that is this, the healing wasn't fast enough. Mark chapter 8 and verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. Taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village, and after spitting on his eyes <laughs> and laying his hands on him, all I want to say is this. If you spit on anybody's eyes, <laughs> you better get his results. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, after spitting on his eyes, laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? He looked up and he said, I, I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. Then again, he laid hands on his, on his eyes and he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. So this man gets Jesus to pray for him. Jesus asks, how's the sight going? He says, I, I see men, but they look like trees walking around. And, and this, is, this is Jesus. It's like, you know, you're in the lineup and they say, okay, your prayer partner will be Jesus. Okay? You got like, I got like Jesus praying for me. How's it going? Well, right now, I just see trees walking around. <laughs> this is Jesus. And, and the point for many people is, is that they think that healing should always happen instantaneously and miraculously. And you can get a miracle, and yet it still happens over time. It still happens o over time. And, and here, Jesus wasn't, like, ashamed or, you know, withdrawn by any mean or felt like, Oh, my first, first prayer wasn't in faith, so I have to do a second. He just prayed. He didn't analyze. He, he didn't evaluate. You know, he didn't go home pouting. He just like, okay, well, we're not done. You know, and kept going until he got the results. He just kept praying. So healing does, first of all, does not have to be instantaneously. The scripture says lay hands on the sick, and what will they do? They will recover. They will recover. Well, this man recovered his sight. Otherwise, how did he know what a tree looked like? Right? So he got a recovery, and recovery isn't necessarily instantaneous. So somebody could pray for you tonight, and, and you're going to have people, there's going to be people that you're going to feel something right tonight. Yeah. Like something's like, boom, oh man, I got movement where, oh, that pain is gone, and, you know, or whatever the case may be. And by the way, we're going to put a number up. We want you to text and tell us. What happened? So that's, that's how you're going to be able to give us feedback is just through your testimony, okay? And um, we overcome by the word of our testimony. But uh, but I want to say, uh, 
That was so easy, that one. I want to say this. Don't let not having an instant miracle rob your faith from a recovery. Okay? It's like, okay, I didn't get an instant miracle, but the word says recover. Thank you, Lord, I'm recovering. Thank you, Lord, I'm recovering. Number four, here's another hindrance. I think all well, these next few, I'm going to start to really, like, holy cows are going to get squashed. Watch out, for, watch out for cow guts. That's all I got to say. Number four, passivity. Passivity. You, you watch the scriptures, how passionate people were to get healed. Blind Bartimaeus, this guy was crying out to Jesus he was loud enough to irritate the disciples. They're like, would you shut up? Jesus, have mercy on me. To the point where he, he, you know, he, he couldn't just walk up to him. It was his only way of reaching Jesus. So he had to just get loud, man. He's like, I know he's there somewhere. I'm just going to get loud. And, um, but here's what he didn't do. Bartimaeus did not sit passively on the sidelines while Jesus was passing away with sort of a, well, if Jesus wants to heal me today, you know, I, I'm sure he'll notice me. He'll get a word of knowledge. You know, he'll, he'll just, he'll, I'll catch his eye. If, if it's God's will, you know, then he'll, he'll forget that. He's like, it's my will. <laughs> you know, I want to get healed, Jesus. And, and there's, this, there's this, this passion and faith. Reaching out saying, God, I'm getting a hold of you tonight. I'm resolving this tonight. I want my healing tonight. Think about the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years. The scripture says she was in a crowd. And she's trying to get to Jesus, and, and Jesus is walking through this crowd. And, you know, he's bumping into all these people, but this woman made her way through the crowd, just pushed her way, you know, through to, to, get, to, to get to Jesus. And you got to realize, this is a culture where, where your gender mattered in the sense that men would have been preferred, probably mostly men would have been closer to Jesus and, and, than the women would have. I'm just saying just because of the, the culture. But she's like, I don't care who's there. I'm getting, I need to touch him to get healed. And she was thinking, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And she pushes her way through and her faith was what touched Jesus, not just her hand. Because Jesus stops and looks at his disciples and says, who touched me? wasn't what he meant. What he meant was, who touched me with faith to receive? I just felt virtue leave me. I just felt something move in me that touched this person, that met this person's desires. And, and then, of course, he engages her in conversation and talks about the fact that she had such faith in her attitude. And that's why she fought to get through, to reach Jesus, knowing that he could heal her. How about the four friends who carry their buddy on a stretcher to meet Jesus and when they showed up to the meeting, it was packed. They couldn't get in. Uh, they, they had to go on the roof and tear tiles off and lower his body. But, but they didn't stand outside thinking, well, if it's God's will, when Jesus comes out, I'm sure he'll come over and, you know, minister to our friend. They didn't st stand off thinking, well, you know, we came, but ah, the place was packed, so... It's probably not the will of God for you to get healed. You know, we'll just go home. Sorry, you know, the place was packed. Instead, what do they do? They get in there and they start ripping the roof off, lifting this guy up. And they're like, you know, excuse the expression, but come hell or high water, we are getting you to Jesus because we know if we get you to Jesus, problem solved. Yeah. And they were like, nothing is going to stop us. We maybe can't open the door, but we can open the roof, and we're going to find our way in. And, and there's this, just this um, passion, and there's just this fortitude, and there's just this I am getting to Jesus attitude of heart that made sure... It wasn't just, well, we'll see what happens. Same thing with the woman of the issue of blood. She could have just stood on the side and said, well, the Lord's passing by. Jesus, Jesus. No, it wasn't like that. It was like, I'm getting healed. This is my answer. I'm sick of this. I'm going to believe God. How about the Canaanite woman? This one here gets amazing. 
Matthew chapter 15 and verse 22. It says, the Canaanite woman from that region came out and began crying out. Now, you got to realize, Canaanite is not Israelite, okay? So, in other words, not Jewish. Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. Wow, talk about problem in your prayer life. <laughs> crying out to God and Jesus in the flesh didn't even answer her. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, send her away. Boy, these guys get annoyed at people, don't they? Send her away because she keeps shouting at us. We're tired of all these loud people you keep attracting. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Oh, man, it just went from bad to worse. Now, first, you're not talking to her. Now you're telling her, I only minister to the, Israel, the Jewish people. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now he called her a dog. Uh, he's referring to Gentiles. He's referring to non-Jewish, okay? Uh, you know, in our culture, that's funny, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> anyway, so here he doesn't talk to her. Then, then you know, then he te tells her, like, I'm not, sent to your, I'm not sent to your community. I'm not sent to your culture. It's, it's like, Jesus, you are not being culturally sensitive right now. <laughs> and <laughs> instead he's like, no, I'm not sent to you. I'm sent to the Jewish people. And come on, Lord, I want to, uh, you know, I you're a dog, like you're, you're, you're a Gentile, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to throw crumbs. I'm not going to throw, throw, you know, the children's bread, rather, to the dogs. And then look what she says. But she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, a woman, your faith is great. It'll be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. The woman had plenty of reason not to believe that Jesus would heal her daughter. She wasn't Jewish. Jesus wasn't really interested in talking to her. The disciples wanted her to leave because she's yelling. Even Jesus argued against why she shouldn't. Imagine this. Jesus is teaching her why she shouldn't get a miracle. I mean, I don't know what your struggle is with your faith, but <laughs> seriously, Jesus is like, okay, like I'm Jesus. People get healed around me, but here's why it shouldn't happen to you. Three points. You ready? Because he's a preacher. Every three, three points. He's teaching her why she shouldn't get a miracle, and she's like, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I, even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table. So guess what, Jesus? If you just give me a crumb, that's all I need to get a healing for my daughter. I just need a crumb. I don't even need a loaf of bread. I don't need a slice of bread. I just need a crumb. And Jesus said, your faith is great. What was he pointing out? That she believed so much that she should get healed that she had a tenacity that refused to quit pursuing Jesus until she got what she wanted. Next one. Here's another hindrance. Being tentative about the will of God. Tentative about the will of God. In other words, well, we're not really sure if it's the Lord's will. That's what tentative is, an uncertainty. Listen, the nature of faith is that we believe and then we receive. We believe and then we receive. That's how faith works. That, that's wh what faith is. It is founded on the promises of God in the person of Jesus. So out of reaching and ponder, out of reading rather, and pondering and embracing the promises of God, faith should be established in our hearts from his word. That's where it comes from. So the foundation of tonight is right in here, in your Bible. It's from the word of God. Now, Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Confidence about what we hope for. And then it says assurance about what we don't see. We're assured of it. Not see it yet, but we're assured. 
Hebrews 11.1 1 in the Amplified Bible says this. Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. I just love that. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not yet revealed to the senses. So when, we ha- when do we have faith? Before or after receiving? Before. Before. That's the, that's the context of faith. How is it, though, that we have assurance, we have conviction, we have confidence, and we have confirmation before we actually have possession? We have all those things because we got them from the Word of God. We got them from the promises of God. That's where we got all that. That's where we got all that. Faith is not the after effect of the event. Faith comes before the event. Faith happens before the event, not after. So to function in faith for healing means we get the promises of God in our heart first. That means we determine that healing is the will of God. Faith doesn't go into prayer with the will of God still in question. I want to say this. This is strong tonight, but it's true. Faith does not go into prayer with the will of God still in In question, listen, people are like, well, I don't know if the jury's out. Let me tell you something. The jury's out. It's already decided. Our God is a healer. Our God's desire is to heal. Jesus' will is to heal. The will of God is not in question. You can take that off the table. Faith goes into prayer believing. I have received because God has promised. Perceiving as real fact what is not yet revealed to the senses. Don't look at your circumstances to determine the will of God. If you do, the enemy will will basically secure unbelief in your life. I'm telling you, this is how it works. People get into evaluating their circumstances all the time to determine the will of God. But you build faith on the word and then the word works inside of you to change your circumstance to bring it in line with the will of God. I don't ask my, I don't ask my bank account, what's God's will for you? You know, when I was first starting out and walking with Jesus and we weren't making a bunch of money and all, I didn't go to my bank account and go, well, I guess, I guess it must be the will of God that we'll just... Rent for the rest of our lives and never own a house and always drive a cheap car and, you know, and just believe for our next pair of blue jeans, you know, kind of. I didn't ask my bank account what the will of God. I just said, well, the word of God says I'm blessed. So guess what? You about to change. You are not staying at this place. Why? Because I got a promise from God that says that's not what my life is supposed to look like. So you're going to change. But the point is this. Don't look to your circumstances. Look to the word. Think about the man who Jesus prayed for. And then he begins to see trees walking. You know, he he didn't respond to Jesus and go, well, I guess that's the will of God. I'll just go around seeing everybody. You're an oak. You're a maple. You're a walnut over there. In that moment, he could have bought into the notion Well, I guess that's the will of God. I got some healing, but not all. You know, in Exodus 15, 26, God said that he would put none of the diseases on you that went on Egypt. And and then he says this, for I, the Lord, am your healer. But I love this. I will put none of the diseases on you. I will put none of the diseases on you. Don't buy into religious talk that says God made you sick to teach you something. That is not Bible. Not, Not only is it not Bible, I think that's an evil thought. I mean, my kids need to learn a lot, but I, I never made them sick to try and teach them anything. Don't, here's another one. Don't, don't think it's your cross to bear in life. You know, last Easter, of course, we preach about the cross. Duh. <laughs> what are we going to do? Oh, I'll preach about the cross. It's Easter. And when we did, there was a lady sitting right about here, and uh, she heard and she heard it in here, she didn't have to bear the cross of the injuries that happened to her life from an accident years ago that caused her to walk with a cane, that Jesus had taken that to the cross, and by his stripes, you're healed. And at the end of the service, put the cane on the stage and walked out, and I talked to her son. (laughs) 
And I, I talked to her, to her son, you know, a couple days later, and he's telling me, she's up and down stairs and all of this and just totally, totally healed. Psalms, I'm just going to give you a few verses and then we'll go, go into prayer. And if you're feeling like, wow, we went a long time on the message part, that's important. Yeah. Prayer only needs a moment. But the more we get your, the word in our hearts, the more prepared we are for that moment. Psalms 103 verse 3 says this, who pardons all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. That's our God. Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. The only promise that goes with the stripes or the whipping that Jesus took, the only promise that goes with those stripes is healing. In other words, the full intention of the stripes of Jesus was about our healing, that he took that to the cross. 1 Peter 2, 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. You see, in Isaiah 53, he says, by his stripes we are healed. It was looking forward. It was prophetic. It was saying this is going to happen. But in 1 Peter 2.24, it's a letter written to the church telling the church, you know all those healings that are going on? Guess what? By his stripes you were healed. That actually was secured back when Jesus went to the cross. The only thing the stripes are for is our healing, being made whole, physical healing, mental healing, emotional healing. The stripes of Jesus are all about healing. Matthew 10, 1, Jesus summoned the 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of of sickness. I love how the Bible just covers it all. It doesn't leave room for anything. In John it says that he sent them out to preach and to heal the sick. Do you know that the commission of the Bible is that we preach Jesus and we heal the sick? Yeah. That both. That that is both part and parcel. You say, well, how, how do you know that? Well, the Bible tells us. But second of all, because you look at the prayer in Acts chapter 3, when, when the church was starting to get persecuted after the miracle of the lame man who was, who was uh, you know, at the temple and he gets healed and he's walking around and, and now these guys are thrown in jail and then they're let out of jail and they're told don't preach Jesus anymore and they're having a prayer meeting about it. And then in, in verse 5 it says he began to give them, no, I'm, I'm in the wrong verse, sorry. That's my bad. The guy at the back is probably freaking out right now. <laughs> Acts 4.29 says this, and now, Lord, and now, Lord, look at this prayer, and now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence. So they're praying. They've been intimidated by the government and told, don't you speak about Jesus anymore. So they're praying and asking God for confidence while they speak. Well, you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They're praying not only for confidence to preach the word and to speak testimony of Jesus and to preach the resurrection, but that God would extend his hand to heal and signs and wonders. Why? Because they knew that Jesus commissioned them to do both of those things, and they totally expected, anticipated, moved in, and experienced God changing lives through salvation and miracles and signs and wonders and healing, the whole kit and caboodle. That's why Paul said, my word didn't come to you just with words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of power. And what I love about that testimony that Sarah has is, is great. That family's got a baby. I love that. That is so awesome. But what's even bigger is that the world just got another testimony that there's a guy named Jesus who rose from the grave and he's alive and he still heals and he still does miracles. Well, I think I should begin to wrap up. There's one thing I want to say. Acts chapter 3, we'll go there. <clears throat> Last uh, verse of Scripture. And this is when they're ministering to the lame guy going into the temple. And it, and it says this in verse 5. It says, he began to give them his attention. You know, because he's like, hey, you got arms for the poor. And, and then Peter's like, look at me. 
he began to give them their attention. And I love this next three words. Expecting to receive something from them. Expecting to receive something from them. You know, that, that's the attitude we should, we should come to God with tonight. Lord, I'm coming to you for prayer. Expecting to receive something from you. I'm not just coming to, well, I'm going to get prayer and try this out. That's not, that's not faith. Faith is the expectation before the experience. Right. Yeah, Expecting to receive something from you. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold. But what I do have, I love that. What I do have, I give to you. He said, what do you have? I've got the Holy Spirit. I got a promise from God. I got a commission. I got permission. I can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Jesus told me I could do that. So that's what I have. So I'm going to give you what I got. And he ended up, of course, healed and, and walking and all of that. I just want to say this tonight. Come expecting to receive. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. I, I want to lead us in a prayer. And uh, here's how, how um, I'll instruct after. I'll instruct after. I just want to lead us all in a prayer, if you would. And I'll kind of Simon says this in, in just a moment. But Father, thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word tonight reminded us. Reminded us of the importance of faith. Reminded us that you're a God who heals. Reminded us, Lord, that, that you're the God of today, not someday. And Father, I thank you, Lord God, that tonight, in this place, that you're going to move right now. I thank you that tonight, Lord, as we look to you, we stand on the promises that says, by your stripes we were healed. Lord, we come before you with full expectation of experiencing the power of God touching lives. I just want to lead you in a prayer, if you would. Lord Jesus, I thank you that by your stripes I was healed. So tonight I'm receiving that healing. I thank you that you paid for my sin and my sickness. I thank you. You are the Lord who heals me. Your word tells me that when hands are laid on me, I will recover. So tonight, when hands are laid on me, I receive my recovery to my health. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this content, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any future videos. If you'd like more information about Celebration Church, head over to our website at celebrationedmonton.com. Thanks again for watching and don't forget to subscribe.